Until I was about 20, if you had asked me what I believed, I would have told you I was an atheist or an agnostic, depending whether I wanted to be ornery that day. But most accurately, I would have said that I did not care. I flat did not care. I saw no reason to care, to have any sort of faith or belief or God, any of it. It, it, you know, Paul writes at the beginning of his letter to the church at Rome, says that those who do not believe ignore the obvious. They ignore uh, the signs of God and creation around them. And I guess it just wasn't very obvious to me. Something else that was not obvious to me was how faith had any impact on people's lives. How did faith in any higher power, much less God as revealed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how did that change how we live? Now I could tell you things like, uh, I could see the way that if you walk into a hospital and that everyone who walks in the hospital is cared for, that's a part of a Judeo-Christian Western culture and that it's a profoundly good thing. But 16-year-old Andy did not want to talk about Western culture. What he wanted to know was, did anyone care about me? And what, what had happened was, when we had moved in the seventh grade, we moved to a new community, but we kept on going back to the church in the old community. And I realized this this week, how big of a deal that was. Because what happened was, I saw people at church on Sunday, and I saw the back of their heads for an hour, sitting there with my parents. And then I didn't see those people at all again until next Sunday. And so, the, I didn't... The teachers of my school were not the people I worshipped with. The, the people I saw at my school were not the people I was in youth group with. They weren't the people of my church were not my band parents or my scout leaders. I did not see how them going to church changed how they related to anyone else. Because it was only a Sunday morning thing, I didn't see why it mattered. And so when I went through hard times, and it's not like I had some traumatic time as junior high or high school. We all have traumatic drama during junior high and high school at some point. There was no one at the church that really cared because they were all over in the next community over. And so I went through uh, those first 18 years just simply not caring because I wasn't part of a community that showed me why it mattered. That changed when I went to college, and there was a group of people who, who showed me that they did care. I found friends. I found a group of people at the campus ministry at Truman. And I found a group of people that paid attention, and, and it wasn't just Sunday morning. It was eating lunch together on Tuesday. It was watching a movie together on Friday. It was studying Saturday morning and then going out and doing something stupid Saturday night together. That was, it was more than just a Sunday morning staring at the back of people's heads thing. It was seeing how following Jesus made a difference in their lives and how they cared about me and about how they cared about others. And they, when they said, come and see, when they said, come to church, we've got something, then I listened because it wasn't just Sunday. It was an entire way of being cared for in, in life. And, and that's what we see in the Gospel of John. We see, uh, if you look in the Gospel of John about how Jesus gathers his disciples, he says, follow me to one of the first disciples who then goes and gets his brother, who then goes and gets his friend, and that friend gets that friend. And if you look at how many people Jesus actually invites to follow him, and that those first chapters of John is one. And yet, because he invites the one, it starts a chain reaction of people inviting other people to come and see. And that's how, the, that's how John understands people coming to, to follow Jesus. And so that's what happened with, with me. I, I didn't believe until I was walking and living with people who cared about me, and they said, come and see. And then I did. Now, that is my story. That's the story of one person at one point of, in time. There are many other stories, many other stories of why people believe or do not believe or what changed their minds. And the same thing about uh, today is true back then. There are many people who do not believe in Jesus now. There are many people who did not believe in Jesus back when he was walking around in biblical times. Just like I didn't follow for my reasons, People back then did not follow Jesus for, for their reasons back then. You ever wonder why that is? You ever wonder? I mean, when Jesus is walking around performing these signs, feeding 5,000, healing a blind man, healing a blind man who can't walk, raising Lazarus from the dead, he's doing all of these signs of the goodness of the kingdom of God. Why aren't 
Why isn't like the entire nation of Israel just turning en masse and saying yes to Jesus? Why aren't all of the Jews following Jesus? Yes, like 5,000 Jews show up to, to hear Jesus preach and 5,000 Jews are fed when he feeds the 5,000, but think about how many thousands and thousands and thousands of more people were around and not there. That's kind of the question we're going to chew on today. How does the Gospel of John help us understand how to react, deal with, interact with people who, who don't follow Jesus? Because there's lots of them. There are lots of them then. And there are lots today. Now, the, the, kind of the struggle of this is that the Gospel of John tells the story of what happened, not the story of what didn't happen. We have the story of how Nathaniel and Thomas and Andrew and Mary, they all came to follow Jesus. We don't have the story of, of the folks who didn't come to follow Jesus. They, we just don't know because the Gospel tells us what did happen, not what didn't happen. And, and so I'm going to make a couple educated guesses based on the fact that we're people. And people today are just like people back then. For example, people back then, I'm sure some of them didn't go to see Jesus because they got busy. You ever get busy? Get busy, right? You have to do chores. You, got some, you, got, you have harvest to bring in. You got kids to raise. You got dinner to cook. You got bills to pay. And you know you get busy. And then what happens when you get busy? You don't have time. When you hear about that new rabbi who's come to town to teach, you know what you do? Oh, that's interesting. I'd love to go see him. I got to make dinner. Maybe I'll catch him next time. I'm sure a lot of people didn't follow Jesus back then because they were just busy. I'm sure a lot of people did not follow Jesus because they went once, they heard him once, and then they weren't convinced. Has anyone changed your life based on him listening to them for 20 minutes? I'm sure that's what happened to a lot of people in Jesus' day. They would show up, they would listen to him for one, they'd hear him preach once. Has any one sermon ever changed everything you think about God? And if so, tell me who it was, because I want to meet that preacher. But uh, it, it, it's not likely that everyone heard Jesus and said, yes, that's it. We, it's hard for us to understand that because we have the whole story, right? We have uh, why Jesus came, what Jesus did, how Jesus died, resurrection, the whole nine yards. They didn't have that. They just had one little bit that they saw. And so I'm sure some people were just busy. I'm sure some people were just simply not convinced. I'm sure some people were not looking. I mean, if you're happy with your rabbi, why are you going to go look for this new one? Let me ask you a question. Anyone looking for new, a new water heater right now? Anyone? No. There could be an ad for the greatest water heater in the world, greatest sale in the world in the newspaper this Wednesday, Thursday, and, and you know what you do? You just flip past it because... Is your water heater broke? Nope. You look for a new water heater when yours is broke. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Same thing. If you're happy with your rabbi 2,000 years ago, are you going to go looking for a new one? Nope. And so I'm sure that a lot of people, they were just simply not looking. And so a lot of people were busy. A lot of people heard of Jesus once and were not convinced. Some people are just simply not even looking. And, and then there's another group of people who are so wrapped up in the current system of the day that uh, for them to change would have been, uh, well, they, know where their, they knew where their bread was buttered, so to speak. There were people like the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the scribes who they had, their way of life was built on that being the truth. This is the way to come to God. And so the, the Pharisees, which are sort of your blue-collar local leaders, and the Sadducees, which are your more white-collar educated, they're all in the city folks in Jerusalem. I mean, they had their way way of going to God and they fight between themselves. They have their, their spats, but they, they, that's where they did their thing. And, um, and they weren't going to turn to follow Jesus very quickly because that's, that's, where they're, that's how they built their lives. Now, I do want to take a, a detour to, to talk about one aspect of this that is an unfortunate aspect of the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John says things like, as we just read, therefore the Jews started persecuting Jesus because he was doing such things on the Sabbath. It, the, the Gospel of John says the Jews. It says the Jews 70 times. It, and as you read through the Gospel, it gets more and more bitter in how that word, the Jews, is used. The, the Gospel of John has been used to condone some very horrible and anti-Semitic actions in the, names of, in the name of Jesus. And part of the problem, well, part of the reason this comes up is 
as we know, because we've been reading the Gospel of John this month, the Gospel of John was written in the 90s A.D. And in the 70s A.D., the temple had been destroyed. The, the temple in Jerusalem. The temple that had stood there since 900 or so B.C. It had been standing there for a thousand years, from 900 B.C. all the way to 70 A.D., when the Romans tear it down. And, and all along, people have been fighting over control of the temple. The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, they're all arguing about the future of Jerusalem, the future of the Jewish people, and the temple is where they argued. And then the temple goes poof. And so all of those groups get scrambled. The only sort of comparison I can make is imagine that tomorrow Washington, D.C. just goes poof. And then 20 years from now, someone starts trying to talk about Republicans and Democrats. It wouldn't make sense. If D.C. goes poof, I don't know what would happen, but I can tell you one thing. Our entire political system would get scrambled, right? And so the idea of talking about Republicans and Democrats after D.C. goes poof makes about as much sense as trying to talk about Sadducees and Pharisees, uh, Sadducees and Pharisees after the temple goes poof. And so what happens in the Gospel of John, it's written after the temple's gone away. And so now the Sadducees and the Pharisees don't exist. And so instead they say, the Jews. And it becomes this term that sort of is a blanket term. All of the Jews. Well, that's not actually the case. When you read the Gospel of John and it says, the Jews persecuted Jesus, please read instead, the religious leaders, Sadducees and Pharisees and scribes. Because that's what it's talking about. Just the language itself had changed because of what happened to the temple. And so we have this question then, based on the Gospel of John, based upon what we just understand, how do we look at people who do not follow Jesus today? First, we'll look at Jews who, who do not follow Jesus today. I don't think this is a particularly pressing problem. I don't think there... Is there a single Jewish person in Milan? That's what I thought. It's not a pressing problem. But it is important, I think, to say that Jews are always God's chosen people. It's not that we replace them and now they're out. The Jews are always God's chosen people, period, end of story. And I think John Paul II put it best, one of the previous popes, when he called the Jews our elder brothers in the faith. That seems about right. The Jews are always God's chosen people. And many, and we read in later places, even while John is, is talking about how the Jews persecuted Jesus, it also talks, this is John 11, many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and seen what Jesus did, raising Lazarus, believed in him. So many Jews did come to believe in Jesus. And so that's what we think of the Jews today. What about people today who do not follow Jesus, who are just out in the community? Well, I think they're probably much like the people 2,000 years ago. They're busy. There are plenty of people who tell me, and I'm sure you've heard before, I'd love to come to church, and, but you know, Sunday's my only day off. And, and you know, I work Monday through Saturday, and I've got to do all my chores on Sunday, and that's when the family shows up. That's the only time I can sleep in, and they're just busy. I'm sure people are not coming to church because they're not convinced. They've heard what the church has to offer, and you know what? They don't buy it. They just flat don't buy it. I'm sure that there are people not coming to church because they're not looking, because the water heater's not broke. They're happy with how their life is going as it is, and why would, why would they try to change their life? Life's going well. And, and there may be some people like the Pharisees and the Sadducees who are kind of wrapped up in another way of faith, but uh, not, not likely, not, not here in my own. Most of all, I think we need to be aware that when it comes to talking about people who are not following Jesus, we're not talking about groups. It's not that the Pharisees had a big group meeting and they all had a vote. Okay, Pharisees, are you going to follow Jesus or not? It's not that the Pharisee decided to follow Jesus or not. It's that Nicodemus, one Pharisee, did. Another Pharisee didn't. Individuals made decisions about whether to follow Jesus. In the same way, it's not that the Jews did not accept Jesus or the Jews did accept Jesus. It's that there are a whole lot of people 
They're Jewish. Some of them did accept Jesus. Mary, Martha, Lazarus, Nathaniel, uh, John. I mean, you can go through Paul. The whole list of people in the New Testament. There are a whole bunch of Jews who do follow Jesus. There's a whole bunch of Jews who do not follow Jesus. And each of them had to make their own individual decision. In the same way, the campus ministry over at Truman, they did not go out to convert the campus. They went out to make friends. And they did, with me. And then I decided to follow Jesus based upon what began there. People make individual decisions to follow Jesus. And so, how does that shape what we do? What we have seen in the Gospel of John is that Jesus creates these signs. He creates these miracles. He creates these events that show how good God is. And then he's willing to talk to people about it. He, he makes the water into wine, and then he talks to Nicodemus. All right? he, he, he heals someone, and he's willing to talk to the guy who he's just healed. He, he makes events that show how good God is, and then he, sh- then he talks to people about it. And I think that's about what we do today. We go out and we create signs of how good God is. We go out and create these signs of the, how radically, beautifully, wonderful God is. And those signs can be small. Be the first person to shake one someone's hand when they walk in the room. Especially if that person is that guy. You ever be in a room with that guy who no one wants to be in the room with and you're the one who goes up and talks to him? That's a sign of the kingdom of God. You're loving the person no one else particularly wants to. It's a sign of the kingdom of God to forgive the person who's hurt you. It's a sign of the kingdom of God to keep someone at home when it'd be easier to send them to the nursing home. It's a sign of the kingdom of God to do something for free just so a person can experience grace. These are all signs of the kingdom of God. We go forth to do, do those signs to be good news to, to all people, whether they have money or not, whether they are educated or not, whether they have a job or not, whether they look like they need help or not. Because I can tell you one thing for certain. 20-year-old Andy running around at Truman did not look like he needed help. But I did. You never know who needs Jesus. And we all need Jesus. Some people have admitted it and some have not. And so that's what we do. We go out to offer signs of the kingdom of God, whether it's feeding the 5,000 and it's the biggest thing we can do, or it's something very, very small. And we do those things praying for the people who are busy that they might slow down and notice what we've done. Praying for the people who are not convinced that they might listen again. Praying for the people who are not looking that they might realize there is actually a need there. So that when such folks, when they look around and they, they're trying to see something better, they know where to look. Because we've shown them. And so this week, I want to invite you to go out and, and be formed by the Gospel of John. To go out this week and to do something, do a sign of God's kingdom. Which is a really high fluting way of saying, pick a person. Can you pick a person right now? Pick a person in your mind. Pick someone you know. And figure out something you can do to show them God this week. Buy them them a free lunch. Take them out to dinner. Send them a card. Do something to show them the love of God. and, And if it's surprising, that's even better. And if they ask why, you can tell them. Because I'm trying to follow Jesus. They might be busy. They might not be. Maybe they respond. Maybe they don't. But as we do that day after day, week after week, that is how people see that we have something to offer. And then they come to accept it. Amen.